نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا صدق الله العظيم My respected listeners we are approaching um, the month in which Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born and where the dunya history of the dunya changed because of this person's birth many things around the world changed and because it was because of his blessing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the ahkam and the rulings of the world in the dunya and the akhirah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obviously has all these things in his knowledge anyway but for us things change drastically for the human and the jinnat race and it was because of this nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam allah's rahmat and mercy widened and it was because of this nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam allah's punishment was delayed and taken away many in many different areas previously because of the disobedience of any ummah and any nation when allah's punishment used to come it used to come to everyone widespread and as we've seen in the quran some of the nations were completely destroyed not even a single person was left in the ummah because of our nabi muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam this type of punishment was been has been taken away that the whole ummah will not be destroyed or punished at one time and everyone will not be destroyed or killed at a certain one, one time and this was all because of our nabi muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says directly in the quran wa kana allah liyu'adhibahum wa anta feehim وما كان الله معذبهم وهم يستغفرون that Allah will not punish the people as long as you are there with them meaning when the existence of Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he was in this dunya Allah was not going to punish the ummah altogether people but the other thing that we have after Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam death from this dunya is that wama kana allah allah will not punish them as long as they are doing istighfar hum yastaghfirun meaning seeking allah's forgiveness for the sins that they have committed as long as people seek istighfar and tauba and ask allah and say sorry to allah for the sins that they've committed allah will not punish people this is a direct command and ayat of the quran So this clearly shows that when we go through troubles in our life <coughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that one of the things that Allah removes troubles from a person's life gham anxiety trouble from a person's life is when they do istighfar man lazima al istighfar whoever makes istighfar tauba and saying sorry to allah whoever makes istighfar and tauba necessary upon themselves allah removes anxiety trouble or in our case in this modern day allah removes depression depression doesn't exist it didn't exist in islam rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam went through anxiety because of the responsibility that he was given as a prophet for the whole of the human race so 
imagine guiding the you're responsible for guiding the whole world and everyone jinnat as well included inside them so it was a, it is a huge responsibility we can't even take control of our own families never mind the whole world responsibility so sometimes we can't even take control of our own own workplace our associates here is the responsibility of whole world so Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam naturally grieved how we're going to take this responsibility. So in the beginning stage, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to be so much grieved that he would go on top of a mountain, wanting to jump to get rid of himself. Jibril alayhi salatu wasallam was sent, <coughs> informing that you are a messenger of Allah. You are the true messenger of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam Mikael sometimes to console the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. With that, what did Allah give them? So Allah instructed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, what we can, shall we say, uh, medication for depression. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him tahajjud salah. Tahajjud salah in Surah Al-Muzzammil. Ya ayyuhal muzzammil qumil la ilaha illa qalila At that time, tahajjud salah O muzzammil person um, covered in cloth What should you do for this case? Tahajjud salah qumil la ilaha illa qalila Stand in salah Little bit of um, night Maybe half the night or less of the night Why? Do you know what the nowadays the medical institutes? So medical institutes nowadays, there is there are medical institutes around the world, medical research, they do medical research. So there's an institute medical research in Australia, what they researched on how to overcome depression. And a person who is completely seriously in serious problem with anxiety and trouble can't sleep they were given certain things to do so in the hospitals and guess what they were given to do this is written by a doctor in his book and they were given that so Muslims went to travel into that area and they found out someone took them let me show you some place so they took them there and to show them what they were going through and how they were medicating on certain people and what they, um, medication they give. So the medication they gave to those people who were going through anxiety and depression was that they should wake up at night, try to wake, um, go to sleep and they should wake up at night, middle of the night, more towards the end of the night and just walk around in the room wash their um, hands and face and feet can you imagine wash their hands face and feet and start to walk around in the room and what's better so whoever can do it is stand just like that staring at the um, ground and if you can't do a uh, yoga what is yoga whoever's acquainted with it will realize yoga movements is actually in the movements in salah so that actually caused the anxiety to be removed, uh, depression to be removed. That was the medication given to them, nothing else. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this 1200 years ago. For what? He was going through anxiety for the responsibility. You see, so many times we will go through different things in our lives only for non-Muslims to research and find out that this is the best medication for this problem. We've heard recently how they've started fasting once a week. The non-Muslim research. Then the once a week started twice a week. They did more research. You should actually, you should fast twice a week. So non-Muslim came on the BBC News and said, I fast twice a week. What is your fasting? Not eating or drinking anything throughout the night, at least for 15, 16, 17 hours. So only a few sips of water, but not eating anything. 
And then once he actually said it as well on the interview, that yes, I've looked at these um, medieval times, according to them, and historical, historical um, times and people, what they were doing, how they were fast for cleansing their inside, and how they would fast for keeping their health stronger, better. So he actually said that I was fasting because this is actually in Islam as well, is, is well Islam as well, and this is the Prophet used to fast one, uh, <coughs> once, twice a week as well. So it actually matches them as well. So he's not a Muslim who's saying this. <coughs> now my question is, do we have to go and see these research and find out about the research that the medical institutes have done in order to follow on Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa and believe our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa Do we have to go to, through this research to find out that wow, this is a medical benefit, physical benefit of a person. Do we have to go through that trouble when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Allah had given it over a thousand years, years ago? We didn't have to do that. You see, they were in the Philippines once, some doctors, some brothers, Tabligi brothers. So they were in Jamaat and they couldn't find a place to do wudu. So they went into a local river and next to the river there was a church. So they went to wudu. You know how we do wudu. There was a um, priest looking from the distance. When they finished wudu, they asked him, what were you guys doing? Um, we were just cleaning ourselves for prayer. Is this how you clean? So he thought that these people are really mad, meaning they're disturbed in their mindset or pagal. They um, medical, they got a problem. They insane. So he said, "Oh my goodness, we treat our insane people by washing this part of the body that you've just washed." Is this what you... So they ask, we just do that because our Prophet told us, Allah told us in the Quran, our Prophet told us we have for us to wash our body and body parts the way we were washed before wudu. Eventually, this led to some of them becoming Muslims. But my respected listeners, do we have to go through this distance for a non-Muslim to do research for a twist, accept what Allah is telling us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about fasting, fasting is better for you. So even if the medical sign, whatever they say, it's not correct for you to fast um, 18 hours, is, you're going to get dehydrated. Did Allah not know this that de about dehydration? In the desert, um, in countries of where there's so much um, heat, does Allah not know about this dehydration? So for us to get some medical experts saying, no, you, you're going to be disturbed, you're going to harm yourself by dehydration if you fast for too long. And then we let our children who are barley and mature, then you don't have to fast if you've got exams. If you've got exams in the summer days, you don't have to fast because you're going to get dehydrated and you'll not be able to concentrate. Well, guess what? In the 1700s, about 200 years ago, 250 years ago, there was a recent medical um, doctor, physician. He was saying <clears throat> about the people who were giving exams and tests. He said one of the best method of getting your intellect corrected before examination is to fast for 40 days before that. Fast for 40 days before the examination. For 40 days. Subhanallah. <clears throat> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam simply said, Allah said, Wa anta sumu khairul lakum. If you fast, it is better for you. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Sumu tasihu. Fast and you'll gain health. Fast and you'll gain what? Health. Did we have to wait for these medicate the doctors, physicians, non-Muslim researchers to tell us that in fasting is good for you and your health? 
Allah told us over one and a half millennium ago. So my respected listeners, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent with all the best, he is the best of the creation. If he is the best of the creation of Allah, then whatever he's going to do is going to be the best. This is our belief about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent at a time that according to Allah's knowledge is the best of time. Not in our time. Our time is full of fitna. He was sent at a time where it will be the best of all ages. And that age I'm sending the Quran at a time where it will be able to affect and it will be able to be perfect time for the future generations and years and years and years to come. So no one can say the Quran is outdated. Everything in the Quran will be perfect for every time. That's the reason Allah sent the Quran at that time. That's our Iman, that's our belief. Whatever the Prophet ﷺ did would have been the best of all action. And whatever Allah commanded in the Quran is the best of all action. So if there is something in the Quran Allah says is good for you, you will never find in the entire, if all the angels, all the jinnat, all the historians, all the physicians, all the intellectuals in the entire world to get together to find something better, it will not be possible. Why? Because the Creator Himself is saying this is the best. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about olive oil, olive, what thin you are zaytun. So Allah takes an oath on figs and olives. And Allah says, مِن شَجَرَةٍ مُبَارَكَةٍ زَيْتُونَةٍ لَا شَرْقِيَةٍ وَلَا غَرْبِيَةٍ So Allah says, مِن شَجَرَةٍ مُبَارَكَةٍ This oil, this fruit is from a blessed tree. Okay, so figs and olives, Allah has taken an oath about figs and olives. And Allah says, this is a shajara best, the most blessed tree. Okay, so olives. Do you think they're going to find any benefits in the olives? They already have. There's no, there's no better oil existent besides olive oil that's best if you can get the actual ones. Okay, vinegar for example. This is a khutbah of Jum'ah, bayan of Jum'ah. But the reason I'm saying all this is sometimes we forget our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Quranic injunctions and we look elsewhere to find our answer when Allah has already told us the answer over here. We're just not bothered looking into the Quran and Sunnah. So, vinegar. There was this one non-Muslim lady, she did research on vinegar. And she wrote a book, Thousand and One Benefits of Vinegar. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa simply said, What a beautiful salam and curry vinegar is. That's it. If these words were a beautiful salam curry vinegar is, and it came from the Prophet Sallallahu tongue, and everything he speaks is directly from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Can you find an alternative that's better? Impossible. We're not going to find anything better. So many of these similar. We look at the Sunnah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how to treat um, our children, how family, family life, everything like that. What things Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam liked. The food that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam liked. The drink, how much drink he used to have. Someone asked, is it better to... Someone has Hz. Shaykh Muhammad Zakaria Rahmatullah Is it better to have uh, mitai and sweet before food or after, after food? So what is it? Um, did Nabi, what, what did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have? Before food or after food? Hz. Shaykh Aladiz Rahmatullah simply said, You've gone into such discussion. How, how much food did the Prophet ﷺ used to have anyway? How much food did he used to have anyway? The actual sunnah is to not have food. Meaning, he used to fast very often. And hardly say that Aisha ta'ala is saying, sometimes our stove used, did not used to have any um, fire for two or three months in a row. Meaning, there was no food cooked in our house because of poverty. So how much food did the Prophet ﷺ really used to have for him to have um, before or after sweet? 
Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi said about dates. Look at this now, dates. Just recent research. He said this is a blessed, barakati food. And the words is mubarak, barakati blessed food. So blessed sweet. So what did research now tell us? Do you know the al athletes, football players, tennis players, all the players, what they do in their um, containers now? They have dates in between the player and play. Why? Did they have to have do research and find this the best thing to do? And we just fell behind when Allah gave it to us thousand years ago. Look what's happening to the Muslim Ummah. We actually ignored our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his Sunnah, and we're looking elsewhere for the answers. Dates, simple thing, and we don't like dates sometimes. Our children. We've never brought them up in this manner where they would love the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simply said, In the messenger of Allah, laqad kana lakum fi rasulillah. In the messenger of Allah, you will find a beautiful example for anyone who desires the akhirah to follow. To follow for this person who desires the akhirah, who desires to be successful in the akhirah. This is our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, my respected brothers. Rabiul Awal is coming, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born. In the, just because of the barakat of Rabiul Awal, discuss with your children about the life and sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Implement, try to implement any sunnah. Take one sunnah for a week. And this is one sunnah I'm going to implement in my family. Miswak for example. The whole week. Do you know what they found about Miswak? There's so many sunnahs that they've, they've done research. Miswak, non-Muslims are saying this is one of the best tooth, um, toothbrush for the gums and intellect of a person, eyesight of a person, brain of a person. Did they have to do research on Miswak for us to know? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did Miswak every salah. He instructed, if it was not difficult for my ummah, I would have instructed, I would have commanded, commanded them to use Miswak for every salah. For what? Gums, eyesight, brain, intellect, inside. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is being given the best. He's the best of the creation. So teach ourselves, our children, who this person is. One sunnah a week. Can we do that? One sunnah a week. Don't do five, six, seven, or one sunnah a day. It's not going to work in the house. When the children and family or yourself as well, just take one sunnah. Okay, this is one sunnah. Can you imagine if you were to take one sunnah a week and practice upon one sunnah, you would be practicing 52 sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in one year, meaning applicating them in your life, applying them in your life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the true understanding of his deen. May Allah give us the true understanding of the Prophet ﷺ and his worth. Jazakumullah Malik, who could